Let's stand together and let's sing I Am Free. So 1 and 2 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And then in verse 13 it says, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He saved them out of their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces. Amen. Amen. When God does something, He does it right. How useful do you think a chain in pieces would be? It would be very effective, wouldn't it? So when God does what He does, He totally takes away the chains and the bondage of the enemy. 
I don't know what situations you may have brought with you today. You know, we think first off about the chain of sin. And yes, Jesus Christ came to break the chains of sin. He broke the chains of death that now we have the promise of eternal life through him. But he also breaks other chains that can bind us. You know, we can be a Christian and we can sit there and slowly let chains begin to bind us in our lives and begin to hold us back. And there are things and effectiveness that God wants to use with us. And it's not happening because we've let chains begin to build up and hold us back. But see, he's the chain breaker, amen? Yeah. So as we sing the song today, Chain Breaker, I want you to think about it. Whatever chains may begin to have held you back, may it begin to interfere with you being effective for God and doing his will. Jesus is the chain breaker. Yeah. And all we have to do is look to him and he'll remove those. He'll break those chains in pieces because he is that good Lord. So let's sing together, Chain Breaker.
for me if you would. We want to go before the Lord in prayer. Um, and Angela, you were mentioning um, is it serenity. Serenity, we need to remember her in prayer. So let's let's do pray for her. Continue to pray for um, the ones in our church that's already we've mentioned them many times. You know, um, I may be out of order to say it, but I'm going to say this. Sometimes when you look out across the congregation and you look for the praisers okay it's true right you look for those who are really praising and worshiping you can tell the people who've walked through something because they have a lot to praise him for I guess what I'm saying is just because tragedy hadn't hit you find it deep in your heart to praise him just as much as those who's walked through those tough times because he's worthy his sacrifice for our salvation alone is enough for all our praises for our time today. Amen. So let's remember each and one, every one of these. Uh, thank you for your continued uh, prayer for our daughter, Hope. She did give birth to a beautiful little girl uh, yesterday, and we're so thankful for God strengthening her and taking care of that baby. So continue to remember that family in prayer. Let's just go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for all your blessings upon us. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God who created this world. Lord, you are God alone. Lord, you don't need our praises. Lord, that's not why we praise you. You're fine. You are complete without anything from us. But God, we praise you because we need to. We were created to, Lord, and we have a hole in us that if we don't fill it with you, we're incomplete. So, Lord, we glorify you as the creator of all of our world and as the savior of our souls. And we glorify you. We praise you. We thank you, God, for the ones that we brought before you because, Lord, you have taken mighty care of them, Lord. You have met the needs, Lord, over and abundant what we can expect. You've walked them through cancer, Lord. You've walked them through surgeries, Lord. You've walked them through so many things, God. You've poured out your power. You've done a work, dear God. And you've allowed the bodies to heal. And we just continue to glorify you for that. Lord, touch serenity. We ask, Lord, that you just minister to her. Lord, your healing touch, your strengthening touch, dear God. Heavenly Father, and we just glorify you for what you've done. Lord, we pray now for this church, God, that you just continue to touch us as a congregation. Lord, we want to reflect you in all we do. Lord, we ask you, Lord, make us be more like Jesus. Lord, make us look more like you. Let us walk more like you. Let us talk in our conversations more like you. Lord, more of you and less of us is our prayer. Lord, each and every one of us in this church, we want to reflect you. And we want this church to be that house of love. God, that you can use, that you can bring in the hurting. Lord, those who are in despair, Lord, those who are in addiction, Lord, those who are in sin, whatever the needs might be, that you can bring them in and you can give deliverance, Lord, because, Lord, deliverance only comes from you. Lord, there's no 12-step program that's going to fix everything in anyone's life, but there is a step toward Jesus Christ that's going to make take care of everything. And we just glorify you, Lord, and we thank you for who you are. We give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to get ready to receive this offering. But before we do, I want to, you may be seated, sorry, um, make an announcement real quick. The ladies are having a yard sale on the 24th. So that's not this Saturday, but the next, I think. Um, is that 8 to 12? Huh, 8 to 1? 8 to 1. So, um, uh, if you're interested, they're renting out tables. Uh, you can see Sister Julie, and um, she can hook you up with a table and uh, you come be a part of the yard sale. We're looking for God to use that for a good time to raise some money for the ladies' ministries, as well as a good time of fellowship. Amen? And while I'm talking about fellowship, 
I want to thank the ladies for this past prayer service. Everyone who uh, showed up for prayer service what can attest to the wonderful tacos we were able to eat. So the ladies pulled that together for us in our last prayer service, and we're so thankful for that. It was a great time of fellowship. Amen. Um, all right, let's receive our offering. Today is Mission Sunday, so our first offering is our general offering. And then once we're done with that, we're going to pass it again for our missions. Thank you for your support. That's what keeps the church going. Thank you for the support of missions. You know, the great commission he gave us was to go into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the other most parts of the earth. So that's missions at home, missions around the home, missions around the city, missions around the world. You're taking part of that great commission when you give in missions. So we thank you for that as well. Again, the first offering is our regular church offering. Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings upon this offering. Lord, we pray for the givers, Lord, those who have to give, those who do not. We pray, God, that you just put your blessings, Lord. God, use this money for your glory to attain that purpose that you would have it to do. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
preacher, but I'm a teacher. That's what I am. I'm a teacher. No one else says I preach whenever I teach. But whatever the situation, wherever I'm at, I drive Angela crazy. She just wants to know where to put the camera. She don't care. You know, you just, you put it at the back of the church and you'll be safe. It's just okay. The scripture that Andrew, would you put that up there for me, please? It says, this is Psalms 46, 1 through 3. It says, God is our refuge. See, I like that. He is also our strength. I love that. A very present help in trouble. Whenever you have things going on in your life, when you have the fire coming at you, He is your help that you need to turn to. Therefore, will not we fear... Though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, if the mountains get cast down, I'm going to stop here just a second, leave the scripture there. I go to the mountains, matter of fact, this year, I've been to the mountains three times. Yeah, three times this year. I went on way too many vacations this year. I have had four vacations, and my boss says I need to take another one. I'm not sure what he's trying to tell me with this, but uh, I'm going to take another one in a few weeks. But it's, it's it, it's, I let them build up. I got, I got about five months built up now. And so he's, he's telling me I need to not let them build up anymore. Just, I get almost five weeks a year, so it's, it's you know, it's, it's hard to take that much vacation. But I've been to the mountains, and, and I go to the mountains on a regular basis. But I look at the mountains as being something that is solid. I know occasionally there's rock slides and mud slides and all these things going on, but I don't look at one of those mountains up there that I drive through or drive around as being cast into the sea. But what the scripture says here is, is and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, that the mountains themselves actually get thrown away Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with a swelling thereof, other places it says quake, that they quake. So what happens here is, is when this is going on, where is your help? Where is your refuge? Where is the safety that you can find? And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I've got to get my notes. When mountains fall, when mountains fall, that's about as bad as you can get that mountains would fall. It's something that you don't expect to fall. You put your confidence in certain things here on this earth, you just figure they're going to be there. Sometimes it's money. You put your confidence that it's that it's going that you're going to have money, and and to be honest with you, a lot of people today have more money now than they they have had in the past. 
You put your trust in the government, the social media sometimes. I'm not saying you should. TV, the military. Tell you a story. There was a guy, KSM. That's what I'm going to call him. KSM. At 16, he joined a group. He went to college in North Carolina. In 1986, he graduated from a North Carolina university. He went on in the mid-1990s and tried to do a plot where he was going to blow up a bunch of planes. It failed. Didn't work out. So what happened is, is in 1996, KSM, his last name is Muhammad, met Osama bin Laden. You know what the day is. 21 years ago. Today is 9-11. 21 years ago. He presented a proposal to Osama bin Laden that would involve training pilots who would crash planes into buildings in the United States. Muhammad dreamed up this tactical innovation of using these hijacked planes to attack the United States. Al-Qaeda provided the personnel, the money, logistical support to execute the operation, and Bin Laden wove the attacks on New York and Washington into a larger strategic framework of attacking the far enemy, which was the United States in order to bring about regime change across the Middle East. They had operatives taking flight lessons in the United States. These people had been living here for a while. They checked out. They thought that they were okay. There was a coordination by plot leaders that was based in Hamburg, Germany. There were money transfers from Dubai. There was recruitment of suicide operatives from countries around the Middle East. And on September the 11th, 2001, groups of attackers boarded four domestic aircraft. All that were at air, uh, East Coast airports, three airports. And soon after takeoff, they disabled the crews. They had box cutters. and they took care of them. The hijackers took control of the aircraft. All of these were large aircraft that were headed for the West Coast. There was a reason behind their thinking here that they would have more fuel on it. The planes had somewhere around 20,000 pounds of fuel. I don't know how much that is, but it's a lot. At 8.46 a.m., the first plane, American Airlines Flight 11, which came from Boston, was piloted into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. Most observers at this time thought that this was just an accident involving a, involving a small computer, uh, commuter plane. The second plane, Flight 175, from Boston struck the South Tower 17 minutes later. At this point, there was no doubt that the United States was under attack. Each of the structures was badly damaged by the impact. They erupted into flames. Office workers who were trapped above the points of impact, in some cases, leapt to their, jumped out to their deaths rather than face the infernos that was raging inside the towers. A third plane, Flight 77, American Airlines Flight 77, it cooked off from Washington to DC. It struck the south, southwest side of the Pentagon at 9.37 a.m. Touched off a fire there. They ordered a, a stop to all air travel that day. And within the next hour at 10.03 a.m., the fourth aircraft from Newark, New Jersey, 
crash near Shanksville in the Pennsylvania countryside after its passengers, they had been informed of the other events that were going on. They attempted to overpower the hijackers. At 9.59 that, that morning, the World Trade Center's heavily damaged South Tower collapsed. The North Tower fell 29 minutes later. There was all kind of smoke and debris that filled the streets of lower Manhattan. Nearly 3,000 people died that day. 2,750 in New York, 184 at the Pentagon, 40 in Pennsylvania, all the, the 19 terrorists, 400 police officers and firefighters. They were rushing into the buildings to try to save people. This was not something that was just started on September the 11th, 2001. You can see that this guy had been planning this for a long time. Since he was age 16, when he had joined this, he was thinking along this line. I'm not gonna to read to you today in Numbers 22 through 25, but I wanna to talk to you for a few minutes about something that went on there. What I'm trying to convince you of this morning is, is that Satan has had an attack being planned on you for a long time. Whenever things happen to you, I want you to understand that it is not something that has just come up. It is something that is being planned from way back. Israel was on a journey. They were going somewhere because God had told them to. Much the same way we're on a journey today. They were on their way to Canaan. They camped near the Moabites. Israel was massive in size. There were millions of people. They had already defeated the Amalekites. Their presence brought fear to Moab. And what happened was Balak was the king of Moab. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to find some kind of way to curse Israel. So he called a guy named Balaam to come and to curse them for him. He felt like he had to have that so that what could happen is, is that he would be able to attack them and be able to destroy them. And the Lord warned Balaam not to go. He told him not to go. But... The bid from Balak grew higher. The more money that he kept say, saying that he would pay him, then what happened was is Balaam finally gave in. And as he rode his donkey, you're going to remember the story here. You may not remember that part of it, but you're going to remember the story of the donkey that he was riding on. And the donkey at first went off the trail because he saw something that Balaam didn't. And then after that, he rubbed him up against a, a rock. And then after that, he just laid down and he would not get up, would not move. And Balaam began to beat the donkey and amazingly the donkey spoke to Balaam and said, what have I done to you that you have struck me? And I find it amusing right here. You, you probably don't, but I find it amusing right here that the first thing Balaam didn't do was say, whoa, there's a donkey speaking to me. But you know, it doesn't. He's ticked off. He's mad. And he starts hollering back at the donkey that he would kill him. And the, finally the Lord revealed himself to Balaam and again warned him to say only what the Lord would give him. And then Balaam arrived in Moab. Here, he, he arrived there and he viewed Israel, but he could not curse what God had blessed. That's important. That's important. It's important in your life. I'm not getting to that now, but that's important in your life because what God has blessed in you, Satan cannot curse it. There's a reason that I'm going here. When mountains fall, there's a reason that I'm going here. He could not curse what God had blessed. Balaam tried four times. He looked at it from different directions and he tried four times, but each time he had to bless Israel because God would not allow him to do anything else. And this made Balak angry. This is the king. Made him angry. 
He had paid Balaam well to, to, to have Israel cursed, but instead they were blessed. And Balaam earned his fee another way, though. What he done was, is he says, I can't curse them, but I can tell you how to get them to fall. He gave Balak advice on how to get God angry at Israel. He advised Balak to in, invite the visiting Israelites in for a feast. He said, call them, act like you're their friends. Bring them in. Act like that you want to be part of them. Act like this is what you want to do. And then what I'm telling you to do is, is let your Moabite women mingle with the men of Israel, and it worked with tragic results. There was 24,000 of Israel men committed sins of idolatry, including sexual and spiritual adultery, and they were killed. What he done was, is he said, I can't curse them, but what I can do is I can show you how to get them distracted to get them off of what they're supposed they're wanting they're, what they're supposed to be doing. See, Balaam understood something that we failed to understand. I'm going to tell you something right here that's, that, that's a revelation, but it's not going to come as a revelation to you. If the enemy can discover what anyone wants more than to obey God, they can be defeated by seduction. And you say, oh, let me read that one more time. If the enemy can discover what anyone wants more than to obey God, they can be defeated by seduction. I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes. I'm going to help you understand this. Balaam had great insights and power and wealth, and, but he was beguiled by those things. Balaam was. It was not simply Balaam's strategy, but it was also Satan's strategy that was here, and he has employed it throughout history. He looked for a motive or a desire that can take us out of our ordained purpose, our journey, and bring us the disfavor of God, where we are not serving God the way we should. The New Testament mentions Balaam in three places. In 2 Peter 2.15, it says, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. And then in Jude 11, it says, Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain, they have rushed for profit into Balaam's error, they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. And then in Revelation 2 14, he says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. The problem today is, is that what has happened is, is we have quit going to God, as Philippians 2.12 says, and continuing to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And what we are doing is, not everybody, not you, but other churches, not, not us. But what happened is, is we are, are still doing what we're supposed to do. We're, we're, we're serving God the way we're supposed to. But what happens is, is there's so many churches out there today that are not doing that. If you look at some people in the Old Testament, you will see that Satan has been doing this all along. I'm not going to get into Samson this morning too much, but I'm just going to tell you that Samson, he did the same thing. He had the blessing of God on him. He was killing Philistines. He was taking care of business. He was doing this. And then what happened is, is he turned around and went a different direction. You look at David. David was a man after God's own heart. The Philistine, well, the, yeah, the Philistines could not, uh, not kill him. They could not attack him. They could not take care of him and get him down. But what happened was there was something else that could. Bathsheba. And it wasn't just the adultery. Then he sent a man to the front lines to be killed. Her husband. What the Moabites could not do to Israel, what the Philistines could not do to Samson, what the, the enemies of David, the Philistines and others could not do to David, they did to themselves. If the enemy can discover what we want more than we want God's will, he will offer it. He will offer anything to you. If you want power, then he will give it to you. If you want 
Sex, he will give it to you. If you want money, he will give it to you. He is going to let you get these things. Satan is going to do that. We lose our moral bearings. There is a price we pay. We move out of our calling into trouble. And our nation is in major trouble today because of the Balaam strategy. The enemy has discovered what our appetites are, our desires are, and he has offered to satisfy them. A big thing that is in the world today is self-interest. All we're caring about is self-interest. And it's destroying us. It's destroying our society. It's destroying everything about us. And our highest self-interest would be in denying ourselves and serving God. He loves us and he calls us to a good reward. But what is happening is, is the gospel is getting watered down. I want to tell you today. If you have a gospel, I don't care whether it's you or somebody else, but if you have a gospel that does not have the cross and it does not have repentance, then you don't have a gospel. You have got to have those things. You cannot go without those things. We need to share the true gospel with others. A failure to reach our community with the true gospel of God and the purpose of God has left us wandering in the wilderness and what is happening is is we are fraternizing with the Moabites. We are basically, they are living close to us and what has happened is is we are catching their diseases. The diseases of the world are coming into the church. 9-11-01. Twenty-one years. I don't care if you're younger than 21, if you're older than 21, your life was changed that day. We live in a fear now that we didn't have to live in before that time. But if you go back to Pearl Harbor, you can say, well, they attacked our shores then. But how easily we forget. How easily we forget. What happens is, is your life was changed that day because there's things today you have to do. When you travel today, then there's things that you have to do or you can't do. Satan wants you to lose your faith that God is going to take care of you. That's what he wants you to do. He wants you to lose that. September the 11th will live as one of the greatest tragedies to strike our nation. The events of that day changed the fabric of our society. The, those events and those changes are part of what cannot be forgotten. We cannot forget the lives that were lost on that dreadful day. We cannot forget the lives of those who have been forever changed because of that. We cannot forget the widows who are raising children alone. We cannot forget the parents who will never hold their children again. We cannot forget the heroism shown by ordinary people who rose to the occasion in an extraordinary way. And I want you to know there is power in remembering. And Psalms 11 and 3 says that what can an honest person do when everything crumbles? And we need to remember that the psalmist uses incredible language to describe the reality of tragedy in life. He has said that mountains fall and mountains quake. He said this, and in ancient times, mountains were, were seen as unmovable objects that were permanent. And if a mountain was moved, it was reason to be concerned. And on September 11, 2001, mountains were moved for our nation. The mountain of our security, it failed. We did not feel secure anymore. We knew that they could attack us on our soul. We always thought before that that we could go and fight them where they were at. But that a mountain of our security, our financial security, it crumbled that day whenever the stock market started falling. The mountain of our stability was crushed into chaos. What do we do when the mountain falls? What do we do when the world around us crumbles? And if you look at Psalm 46, 1 through, 3 that I, 1 through 3 that I had up there earlier, you can then see where you go to. You say, God is our refuge and our strength. As the psalm said just a little while ago, he will be with you when you're going through the fire, when the mountains fall, when the things that happen in your life, when the problems come, he will be with you. Even though you may question some things. When we are troubled, God is our helper. God Almighty. I like the way he says it here. 
He doesn't say God is a refuge. He makes it personal. He makes it personal. He says God is our refuge. Amen. He is our strength. God, the creator of the world, he makes it personal. The help that God offers you is specifically tailored to your needs and not my needs. He has things that he helps me with that is for me. And if you think about that the moment, the God of the universe cares about you in a personal way. And we're meant to lean on God when our world falls apart. When the mountains of life come crashing down, we have a rock that we can rely on. We have a rock that will not fall. All of us face situations in life that causes us distress and dismay. And we have mountains that feel unstable in the quaking of life. There's, there's problems with people. It could be job situations or health issues or family matters or it can be financial issues. All these things come against you. Satan is planning on doing this. He wants to knock you down. He wants to get you where you don't trust in God, where you don't you go to God as your refuge and as your strength. I was talking to Tracy whenever I first come, well, I've been here for a while, but when I come walking through in here and he was sitting here and I asked him how he was doing, great. Great. He's went through a lot lately. I want you to know this. There is nothing beyond the ability of God. God wants to be our refuge. He, a place of rest, a place of safety, a place of protection, a place of peace. He is the one that can give you that. Even when the fabric of life is shaken, God is our source of safety. Nothing can ever shake the foundation of God's love and mercy. When we are weary from life's troubles, God is our rest. When life becomes chaotic, chaotic God offers us peace. When we feel forsaken, we are not alone. The psalmist says that God is an ever-present help. He is with us at all times. He has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And God makes a promise that he will always be by your side. He is there even when things feel like they're falling apart. Even when your mountains fall, the things that you think are solid. The same God who hung the stars in place. You know, it amazes me. Richard, y'all can come on up and be getting ready. I don't know how many stars he put into place, but it's not just one galaxy. There are other galaxies. He's the one that created humanity in his image. Is the one that we can call Lord. And you know him by name. See, the name that you can know him by is I am. That's what he says. He says, I am. Not I will be. Not I can be. Not that I might be. But I am. That is the one that you can call Lord. He's the one that parks seas. He's the one that establishes nations. He's the one that heals the sick. He's the one that raises the dead. He's the very same God who is with you when the mountains fall. What I'm trying to bring to you this morning This has been a plot in place for thousands of years. Ever since Lucifer decided that he wanted to be God and he got cast out of heaven and he started coming up with plans and he, he started enacting those plans then 
when he was cast out. I say he was cast out. They say he failed, but I, I say he was cast out. But you can look over in Genesis whenever he started deceiving Adam and Eve. All he was doing was is going after something that they thought they wanted more than the will of God. I'm trying to tell you today, there's a plot in place. He wants to take you down. He wants to take you down. But like this song says, when you're going through the fire, when you're going through the fire, just hold on. Just hold on. I want to go ahead and start singing that if you would. And then I'm going to say just a little bit more. And then after that, I'll close it out. Spirit rises 
lights up in me. It's the thrill of the fire. My weakness is made strong. He never promised that the cross would not get heavy. I would hear it and not be hard to cry. He never offered a victory. Just praise Him. 
would take any plot that's coming against us now because of Satan, that you would take those and you rebuke those in the name of Jesus Christ right now. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You're dismissed. He never promised that the queen never promised that the cross would not get heavy. I knew it would not be hard to find. He never offered a victory without my aid. Help would always come in time. So remember when you're standing.